Welcome to 101, Getting Started with Logos. Logos Bible software is designed to help you do better, study faster. With simple searches, we find a world of information right at our fingertips. The more you learn how to use Logos, the more you can customize it to do exactly what you want. But even someone new to the software can get started with ease, and this training is designed to help you do exactly that. When you open up Logos, you're going to see the home page. The home page is filled with some incredible content that you can actually customize. The main content section will have verses and articles and even devotionals that show up each day for you. And on the left hand side, the sidebar will be filled with things like prayer lists and reading plans and courses and lectionaries, whatever content that you choose. Now the way that you customize this content, in the upper right hand corner of the home page you're going to see a gear. This gear opens up a window that allows you to choose what content that you want to show up on the home page. Simply go over to, for example, Faith Life Today. If you want that, those blog articles, put a check mark to activate it, and those articles will begin to show up on your home page each time you open the software. As far as the sidebar goes, if you create a prayer list or if you create a reading plan, those will show up here. All you have to simply do is find the one that you created, put a check mark next to it, and simply grab it and drag it whatever order you want these things to show up on your sidebar. Note that there's also lectionaries, courses, training videos, websites also on the sidebar that can help you find important information. Now in the upper left hand corner, right above my cursor, you're going to see a search bar. I'm going to refer to this oftentimes as the go box. It's very important that you pay attention to what the go box is because it is different than the command bar in the top center. The go box is extremely important, especially when you're first learning how to use the software because by simply typing in any passage or topic and clicking go, you will have a world of information right at your fingertips and it was so easy to get to. You just typed in what you needed and clicked go. Now the command bar will not quite function like that. So the go box is where we're going to be spending most of our time today, so please take note of where that's at. Now in the upper ribbon, we'll start on the left hand side. The very first button that you see looks like a house. That is your home button. By simply clicking it, it toggles the home page on and off like a cover page. To the right of the home icon, you have a book. Obviously the book is where you're going to find the books that you have in Logos. This is your library. When you expand the library, you're going to see a search bar. The search bar allows you to type in any author's name, any title of a book, just simply type in what you're looking for and that'll get you moving in the right direction. At the end of the search bar, you're also going to see a total number of books that you own. And in the main portion of the window, you'll see all your books listed and you can simply look through those and find the one that you want. We'll have an entire training on how to figure out what all books you have and how to get to the resources you need quickly and efficiently in the 102 training research and writing with Lagos. For now, simply take note of where your library is at and the fact that you can simply type in whatever you're looking for and find it. Please take note that we have put training videos right into your software called Quick Start. If you type Quick Start into your library, you will find those training videos and they're always with you. So anywhere you're at, simply open them up and you can look up information on, on the main features using the software. Now to the right of your home icon, you're going to see a magnifying glass. Now the magnifying glass is your search panel. Simply click and open. The search panel is very important. We will not be spending time today talking about how to do searches. Those will come in later trainings, but for now, please take note of a couple of important details. There are several different types of searches that you can do in Lagos, and you need to make sure that you're picking the correct one so that you can get the right results. Now, each one of the, the searches has its own search helps section in the, in the bottom of the panel. I recommend that everyone spend time playing around and getting used to what each search does and how to build the searches. We have lots of examples in the search helps and these can help you learn how to build the searches in a way so that you can find exactly what you're looking for. In short, the basic search allows you to search your library. The Bible search is going to allow you to search your Bible for English, Greek, Hebrew. The media search allows you to find images and maps 
clause searching helps you see and observe relationships between things like subjects and verbs and objects and even more. The morph search allows you to do powerful searching on specific forms of words in the original languages. Maybe you simply want to find every imperative verb. This would allow you to do that. And then the very last search is our extremely powerful syntax search where you can build some very specific and powerful searches on syntactical relationships. To the right of your search button, you're going to see documents. Documents is a great place to know about because this is where you can actually add content into the software. This is where you can create your own documents. For example, if you want to create your prayer list, this is where you do that. If you want to create a reading plan or do a diagram of a passage, all of that content can be built right from these documents. If you want to create a sermon and build a presentation, you can do that all with our sermon editor. And all of those specific document types will be found here. Now, when you create a new document, they're simply saved over on the right hand side. There's nothing for you to click to save them. Just simply create them and close them and they will all be saved over here. On the right hand side, you can organize these in different ways also. To the right of documents, you have guides. Now, guides are extremely important, and this is where we're going to be spending most of our time in this training, because the guides act as your research assistant. Imagine walking into a library, finding your own research assistant, and all you have to do is say, I'm studying Genesis 1-1, go get me everything that I could possibly need, and they do that in a matter of like five or six seconds. That's what these guides are like. So we will be spending a lot of time here because this enables anyone, no matter what their depth of knowledge using the software, these allow people to be able to find just tons of information really in a matter of seconds. To the right of guides, you're going to find tools. Tools are exactly what they sound like. They're very, there's a lot of them. They're very diverse and they all have a different purpose. You'll see they've all been categorized. So we have tools related to our library, for example, collections or or highlighting. Everyone likes to highlight their resources. This is where you're going to find that tool. We have reference tools that are going to allow you to find information on geography and people and places and things in the Bible. The fact book being a very important tool to make sure that you take note of. In the upper right hand corner we also have passage tools like copy Bible verses. If you're spending a lot of time copying the text and putting it into um, other documents. This is a great place to do that because you can actually control the format. And then last, on the far right side, we have interactive media. We will not be spending time in the inter interactive media in this training, but I recommend that everyone click on all interactive resources, work your way through these di different interactives because what they allow you to do is in new fun ways interact with God's Word and content related to studying God's Word um, really in ways like you've never imagined. So please take note of these because they're super powerful and incredibly helpful. To the right of tools, you're going to see the command bar. Now the command bar has some value to us because it allows us to do things like simply type in a Bible we want to open, hit enter, the Bible will open up right away for us. So it's a quick way to open up resources, even by author's name. You could simply type in an author's last name, find the book, and click, and it's going to open right up. A couple other things that you can do uh, with the command bar is if you're aware of any specific commands, for example, show library, all you have to do is choose that tool and your library will open up right up for you in the workspace. So that's the idea with the command bar. To the right of the command bar, you have the shortcut bar. Shortcut bar is one of those things that a lot of times people don't realize is there, but you can actually drag and drop just about anything you want to shortcut right here into this area. So that includes documents. If you want to drag over the prayer list document, simply grab it and drag it and drop it. If you want to drag over one of the guides or any of the tools, once again, simply grab it and drop it. And you can see I've done this with my highlighter and my copy Bible verses and some of the key books that I use. I simply grabbed them from my library, drug them in the shortcut bar and dropped them. To the right of the shortcut bar, you're going to see spinning arrows. Now, sometimes you will notice that to the left of the spinning arrows, you'll see a little blue button or little blue um, icon. And a lot of times that little blue icon will have a number in it. Those notifications are extremely important because that lets you know what Logos is doing. 
we keep our software updated so if there's any bugs or if there's any errors that we need to fix we're always making sure to make it the best that it can be so that will alert you when there's an update that you need to download and it'll tell you if you need to restart your software or if your library is indexing please let me just for a second mention what indexing is indexing is one of the things that makes Lagos so powerful basically all of your books are indexed together into one massive database so that when you're doing your searches your books all work together and you can find exactly what you need in a matter of seconds Okay, so indexing may take a while, but please let it do it so that the software can function as effectively as possible for you. So to the right of the notifications, you see the spinning arrows. The spinning arrows simply mean that your software is synchronizing. Now, when you get Lagos, you can actually put it on as many devices as you want, as long as it's for your personal use or even the use of a spouse. So every time you install the software and anytime you put it on, you download the mobile app onto your phone or a tablet, you're always going to sign in with the same credentials. So the same email and the same password for the one account. When you see the arrow spinning, that lets you know that all those, those different devices are synchronizing so that if you created a sermon document on this computer and you go to another computer later today, that same ser sermon document and the same settings and so on will all be available. So very important uh, what those spinning arrows represent. Now, we'll come, back, we'll come back in a second to layouts. We're going to spend quite a bit of time there. But to the right of layouts, we recently added a close all button. So once you have a lot of different resources open on your screen and you need to quickly close them, all you have to do is click this X and that will close all the resources that you've got open. To the right of the close all, we have the help button obviously represented by the question mark, but if you need to find online video tutorials, if you wanna go see what other users are saying about different issues or topics, you can simply go there or open the Logos Bible software help to find a great document that can help you find information on just about any feature of the software. Okay, so now we're shifting away from basic navigation. The idea was, man, when I look at my screen, what does all this mean? Hopefully you have a pretty good idea now of generally what you see when you open up the software. But now we're moving into how can I actually make the software do something for me? I wanna start with layouts. Layouts are very important because layouts actually allow you to create the workspace you need for the task you have. So for example, you may have one uh, way you like to organize all your windows and your resources for sermon preparation. But you may also have a different way that you like to organize those when you're studying Greek or Hebrew and so on. And layouts are the way that you can actually customize your workspace for different purposes. Now, when version 7 came out, which was August, the end of August 2017, we added some important layouts, and these are called quick start layouts. So many users were asking questions like, how can I get Logos to just really quickly open up, for example, a Bible and a commentary for me? Or a layout that's designed for really fast and efficient word studies. So what we did is we actually pre-designed some layouts to help you start with the software very quickly. So let's look at a couple of examples of a layout. First of all, we have the Bible and commentary layout. If you want to open your Bible and a commentary, simply click. And you'll notice instantly Logos will open up your favorite Bible and your favorite commentary. Now, please take note that the reason why my software opened up the Bible that it did and the commentary that it did is because these have actually been set up in my library to be my favorites. I can prioritize my resources and put my favorites in that list so that Logos knows exactly what to open for me. Many of you have probably never done this. Please take note, we will deal extensively with this in the 102 training when we're talking about how to get the most out of your library. One other observation that I want to point out is that you'll notice that as I'm working through the Bible, you'll also see that the commentary on the right hand side is actually going to change and stay on the right passage for me. Now the reason why these two books are working together is because they have been linked. Okay, the way that you link panels, so over on the left hand side, we have a panel that has my Bible in it. On the right hand side, we have a panel that has my Bible commentary in it. 
in the upper left hand corner of each of these panels there's a menu okay so you see the book cover and when you click on the arrow to the bottom right of the book cover you're going to see the panel menu now in the panel menu you can do things like increase the font of the resource in case you need help uh, seeing the text better you can also have logos read your resources aloud to you but one of the most important things to know about this panel menu is this is where you link panels together you'll notice that this resource has been set to link set a and you'll also notice when we come over here to the bible that the bible has been set also to link set a what that means is that these are linked together they will synchronize so anytime i change a verse in my bible if i change to romans 8 now you'll notice that my commentary instantly changes too. So linking panels together is a great way to get more out of your software so that you're not having to change multiple resources, but they all stay synced together. So that's one example of a layout. Let me give you a second example. We have two brand new quick start layouts called Greek word study and Hebrew word study. So let's say you wanna study the original languages or a specific word in a passage. Simply come over to the Greek word study layout and click and Logos will instantly put everything on the screen that you need to study out a Greek word. Now no, notice that in the upper right hand corner our Bible has been open and our bottom right hand corner a lexicon has been open so a Greek dictionary. Please note once again the reason why Logos opened up this specific version of the Bible and this lexicon is because I have these prioritized in my library. Also notice on the left hand side we have the Bible word study guide open that has everything that we need to know related to how to study out this word. Now please take note that each one of these panels is linked to link set A. So once again all these panels are going to synchronize together and once again when version 7 came out at the end of August, August 2017, we created a new way to interact with your Bible and your lexicon in your Bible and your Bible word study guide. Now you'll notice these are all linked together. All that I have to do is simply come over to a verse. Let's see, verse 15 says, Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment. So that word bearable stands out to me. What does that word mean? Well, if I want to study that word, watch this. All I need to do is simply click. And because these resources are linked together, my lexicon will automatically change so that I can look up the meaning of the word. And not only that, but my Bible word study guide instantly changed for me too, giving me access to all of my lexicons and also information so that I can find every place that word is found in the New Testament. So when these panels are linked together, the Bible and the Bible word study guide, or a Bible and your lexicon, those resources will instantly change by simply clicking on any word in the text. Very powerful. Now let me give you another illustration. Let's say you really like this layout, but there are some changes that you would like to make. For example, maybe you would rather be able to see more of the biblical text and less of the Bible word study guide. I could simply grab this tab on the panel for my lexicon, move it to the left, and drop it. Notice that I've made a simple change to my layout. I've got my Bible word study guide and lexicon on the left, and I've got the biblical text on the right. Once again, they still work the same. All I have to do is click, and those will automatically change for me. If you prefer this view better, there's a couple things that you can do. You can go back to layouts, to where it says Greek word study, you'll notice when you put your cursor over the Greek word study layout, on the right hand side, a small a menu button will appear. If I click on the menu button, it gives me the opportunity to replace the default layout with the current one that I just created. Now you'll notice that next to Greek word study, it says custom. So for illustration purposes, I'm gonna close all of my panels and simply go back to my layout to where it says Greek word study and you'll notice that instantly it will go back to the layout that I created and customized for my Greek word studies. This is a great way to start with a custom layout and start to design your own. You can also at any time simply go up to the top of the right hand side of your layout section where it says now 
And if you want to save what's on your screen, for example, maybe you're in the middle of a research project and you have all your Bibles and your books and, and all kinds of tools open and you don't want to lose that, you simply click on save as named layout and you can call it whatever you want. Call it study time, whatever, and simply hit enter. And now that layout will be saved for you in the saved layout section in the bottom left. And anytime you need to open this workspace up, once again, all you have to do is simply click your layout and it will open up instantly for you. So layouts are very important when it comes to be able to, to save your work and get back to the study that you have been working on previously. Now for the rest of our time, we're going to be spending our time talking about the Go Box because once again, the Go Box gives us access to just about any kind of information we would want on a passage or a topic related to biblical studies. So I want to begin by looking at an example of a biblical text. Let's say we were going to study a passage out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We simply start typing in our passage, and Lagos is actually going to give us a list of pericopes. So different sections in this chapter that we might be interested in studying. And we can simply finish typing in, maybe if it's just verse 1, we could finish typing in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and click go. In this case, I want us to study 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 through 13. Learn from Old Testament examples. So all we simply need to do is click and Logos will go through the library and pull out everything that we need to study out this text and grasp just about anything related to its meaning. Now, on the left-hand side, you'll notice that two guides have been created for us. First of all, the passage guide has been created. Let's take a second and do a quick review of what all guides are available to us. There's the passage guide, which we're about to view, the exegetical guide, the Bible word study guide, which we've seen briefly, and then we also have the sermon starter guide and the topic guide. In this portion of the training, we're going to see the first three, passage guide, exegetical guide, and Bible study. We'll see them all in action, helping us understand our text. So we have our pest passage guide on the left-hand side. To the right of that, an exegetical guide has also been created. We'll come back to that in a second. In the top center, our five favorite Bible versions have been opened. And in the bottom center, our favorite commentary has been opened. Please note that Lagos automatically linked these panels together so that as I'm scrolling through the text, the commentary will stay on the right verse. In the upper right-hand corner, we have what I like to call the information box of power because it helps us tap into incredible information about the words in our passage. I will show you that in a second. For now, let's spend our time back in the passage guide on the left. The very first section of the passage guide is our commentary section. Please note that Lagos provides you with literally dozens of commentaries that can help you understand your passage, and they'll all be listed here for you. So no having to hunt down the commentaries, no having to turn the pages and all that. Lagos has already done that for you. You simply need to click the link, and in the bottom center, you'll see the commentary will open right up to the right page. So it's here to help you find information quickly and save you a lot of time. The next section will be journals. If you have any journal collections in your Lagos library, Lagos will search those. And if your passage is mentioned in the journal, the articles will be listed here. You can simply add uh, whatever journals that you want at Lagos.com. And this section will begin to fill up with that content. My content is a place that will show you if there's anything like a document or a guide that you've ever created that overlaps with your passage. So it's a great way to remember things that you did maybe months or even years ago. You studied this text and you created a, a passage list and it had a, a verse from this passage in it. And it'll show up here so that you can get back and find that content because maybe it was something really insightful that you studied a year ago. You have all your cross-references listed. What's nice about these is you can read some of the most important ones and simply hover over the text so that you can uh, view the other cross-references. The next section is what we call ancient literature. Ancient literature was a brand new section in Lagos 6, and I think it's one of the most powerful sections we've ever created, especially for students. The idea with this section is how can we make it easier to study our passage 
by interacting with ancient texts outside of the Bible. For example, if we were studying the Old Testament, how could I make it easier to actually interact with ancient Near Eastern texts? That's what this section is all about. How can I interact with, with texts surrounding uh, the Old or the New Testament that give me insight into the meaning of my passage? This also includes studying how this text has been uh, interpreted and how it's been understood in church history. So, I'll give you a few examples. First of all, in the early Apostolic Father writings, we can see there's actually a topical connection with the Didache in our passage. There's a phrase connection, even a, a lexical or word level connection with several of the Apostolic Father's writings. When we move down to the Church Fathers section, all I have to do is simply click, and that particular resource, an English translation, in this case of St. Ambrose, has opened for me, and I can scroll down and quickly identify where he discusses our text from 1 Corinthians 10 in his writings. And we can move through here and do this for many of the church fathers. We can also study this out on an allusion level, so not a direct quotation, but allusions to this text, very clear connections. Once again, we simply click, and we're there reading. Uh, maybe it's St. Augustine. Once again, simply click, and I can see. How is he alluding back to this specific passage? Topical connections. You could even have research on the Dead Sea Scrolls, topical connections. If you're doing any, any study of rabbinic writings and theology, you can actually add rabbinic writings to your library so that now this section will come to life for you. You could find connections in Josephus and Philo and so on uh, in this ancient literature section. Next, we have parallel passages. This is one of my favorite sections because this helps us see if there's any other scripture in our passage. So in other words, if we were in the Synoptic Gospels, are there any other places in the Gospels where the same story or the same thing is said? In our particular case, are, are, are there any Old Testament quotations or allusions here in our text that we could actually go back and study to give us insight into why the author is bringing this up? So in our case, in 1 Corinthians 10, we've actually got a whole passage where Paul's pointing back to quoting and alluding from the Old Testament to warn Christians today not to follow the example of Israel's failure. So as we look at this section, we find so many connections with Exodus 13 and 16 and 17. We can expand this. Exodus 32, Numbers 11, Numbers 14. This is how filled this New Testament text is with Old Testament context. So if we're going to understand the passage properly, as Paul intended it, and as effectively as we should, we have got to grasp the connections that are being made between the Testaments. And that's what the Parallel Passages section is designed to help you do. Literary typing basically is a genre breakdown of the passage that you're studying. Okay, so it has various purposes. You can do some powerful searching with this section but it's also nice to see how they've broken down and outlined the text and what type of genre, type of literary genre, um, this explains that your text is. The very next section that we have is called Systematic Theologies. Systematic Theologies was brand new in Lagos 7 also, and this is one of my favorite features that we've created because this allows us to go into our Systematic Theologies and see how do they appeal to this text as they're articulating key doctrines of the faith. So I think it's very important for us to be able to ask the question of how does this text impact my understanding of the Bible or bibliology? And now we can simply click and see how do our systematic theologies appeal to this text in their discussion of bibliology? Or maybe how should this text impact my understanding of the church? Once again, I simply click and I can see in discussions of ecclesiology, how is my text being appealed to and in informing our understanding of the church? Very powerful section. Biblical theologies is very similar, except for this takes more of a, a, a narrative approach. Biblical theologies, if you have any of those in your library, it will find places where your biblical theological resources actually appeal to your text as they talk about the development of key themes in biblical theology. The next section is confessional documents. Confessional documents allows us to see how the church throughout history and even today in their confessions of key doctrines appeal to this text. 
So all three sections do a similar thing, but from different angles. And so it's really, really great when it comes to research to be able to use these sections. The next section is called cultural concepts. Cultural concepts is an important section because hopefully we all know that the Bible was not written in our culture. So in our text, for example, in verse two, we see that baptism is mentioned. Well, when the Corinthian audience read this or heard this read um, from Paul and heard baptism mentioned, do they picture the same thing that we picture? I'm sure you all have an image of baptism in your head. That is a cultural image. So we have to ask ourselves, what did they think? What did they understand about things like baptism or prayer in that particular time? And so what the cultural concepts section does, much like ancient literature, it actually helps us connect with writings surrounding the Testaments on a topical level. So what do writings at the same time of the new, or as the New or the Old Testament, what do they say about baptism to help us understand what that culture thought? So let me give, let's look at a quick example just so you know how to use this section well. For example, with baptism, I would simply click the word baptism and you'll see in the top center that Lagos has opened a fact book article for us. For visual purposes, I'm going to go ahead and right click on the tab and I'm going to click open in a floating window so that it's much bigger for us. So the fact book is going to provide you with all kinds of information, not just on cultural concepts. But you're going to have images. You're also going to have key passages where baptism is mentioned in Scripture. You're going to have uh, reference works like Bible dictionaries, uh, Bible encyclopedias that discuss baptism in the Bible. You're also going to have any preaching resources you might have available to you and so on. Now, you'll eventually come to the cultural concepts section. This is the section of the fact book that connects with the section that we just started with in the passage guide. Please note what's happened here. Lagos has provided us with, once again, ancient literature that have discussions of baptism within them. So I could look at Nag Hammadi resources, the New Testament Apocrypha, Old Testament Pseudepigrapha, and I could say, wow, in the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha, what were they saying about baptism? What did they think about it? Same thing with the Apostolic Fathers in Second Clement. What was he saying or discussing about baptism? I can look in Josephus and so on. This helps me step back into the biblical time and get a better grasp of what they thought about baptism so that I can step out of my world and hopefully a little bit at a time step all the more uh, into their world. So that is what Cultural Concepts does and how it connects you with the powerful fact book. Next we have figurative languages. Figurative language. This is a brand new section that we recently released so anyone with Lagos now has access to it. But we know that the Bible is filled with figurative language, metaphors, similes, all kinds of very vivid ways of describing truth and reality. So, for example, um, we have in 1 Corinthians 10, 1, Paul says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. When he said brothers, was he literally talking to his brothers? No, he was using a figurative speech where brothers actually represents Christians. He's talking about fellow believers. One of my favorite ways to organize this section is with category, because I think we're all more familiar with different categories of figurative language. For example, euphemisms. There are actually two euphemisms here in our passage. First of all, in 1 Corinthians 10, 5, Paul talks about how Israel was overthrown in the wilderness. So overthrown is a nice way of saying what actually happened, right? A euphemism. Verse 8 is my favorite, where he says 23,000 fell in a single day. So did they just simply trip and fall? No, God destroyed them. He slaughtered them. So to say that they fell is a nice euphemism, a nice way of saying that. So really powerful new section, but you'll see things like metonymy and symbolism uh, all labeled and identified. Uh, next, we have our outlines section. So you can see how different resources have outlined the book and where your passage fits in. We have biblical people, where if there's any people mentioned in your passage, they will be listed here so that you can get a fact book article and learn more about them. For example, we, we don't see a lot of people mentioned specifically in 1 Corinthians 10, but we do see Paul and we do see Moses. I'm simply going to click on Moses. 
you're going to see up here in the top center that once again a fact book article is being opened for us on Moses. I'm going to open this in a floating window so that you can get an idea of what all the fact book provides us with. We're able to see media related to him. We could even open up his family tree and interact with all the people in his family. Events in the Bible related to Moses. And then we can find, once again, reference articles on uh, who Moses is, who was he, what should we know about him. My favorite section of the fact book article on a person or a place is the referred to as section. Because normally if we were doing a character study and we wanted to find all the places where Moses was talked about in the Bible, we would run a search on what? Moses. But is that going to find us every verse where Moses is talked about? No, it's not. Because what about the verses where he's not mentioned uh, by name, but just with a pronoun like he? Or maybe he's called man of God and not called Moses. How would I find all of those places where he's mentioned? That's what the fact book will do for you. And we can simply expand the pronoun section. Look at, for example, at Exodus 2.4, and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now, probably we recognize the context right away of what's going on, but the point still proven here that this verse would not show up if we were just looking or doing a search just on the name Moses. So this is the power of the fact book in the biblical people section of the biblical people section of the passage guide. After biblical people, we have biblical places. Same thing. So imagine reading 1 Corinthians 10 and not knowing anything about the Old Testament. Who is Moses? What happened whenever God led them through the sea? What sea is he talking about? Once again, simply click Red Sea. A fact book article is going to be opened up for you where you can find maps and articles and actually understand what that is all about. Same thing. There's a discussion here about how they were all under the cloud. Well, if you're not familiar with that pillar of cloud that led them out of Egypt, how are you going to find information on that? Once again, the biblical thing, simply click on the wilderness pillar of cloud, a fact book article will open up where you can read those articles and find those passages to understand the context of the passage that you're studying. Biblical events is similar. Also one of my favorite sections. It's going through the text you're studying, finding every event mentioned in the rest of scripture in your passage. So in our case, we see where the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, where Moses strikes the rock, where the water flows from the rock at Rephidim, where the Israelites make a golden calf, and so much more. And if you've never read the Old Testament, or you're not familiar with these stories, how would you get that content so you can understand the passage? Well, all you have to do is simply click and you could go read these passages and understand why Paul is appealing to these events in the Old Testament to make his point. Those interactives we looked at earlier, if there's any of them that help us understand the passage, they'll be listed here. For example, how the New Testament uses the Old Testament. Media resources to find images for you that may potentially be related to your passage. Media collections, like we have a slide deck um, to help you uh, create a beautiful presentation on the, the book of 1 Corinthians, all kinds of great videos that are related to the text. The Atlas section does not search all of your atlases in your software. The Atlas section is specifically the Logos Atlas. So if we have a map in the Logos Atlas on 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13, it would be listed here. But in this case, we don't, so there's no information showing for us. We have a we have a music section where you're going to be able to find a hymnal where you can find some incredible old hymns that relate to the themes in your passage to help you connect not only the, the depth of content that you're studying, but also connect it uh, with the depths of your heart so that you can uh, make that connection and, and even move into a devotional time with the Lord. There are many other sections that I would recommend that you spend some time looking at in your passage guide. You'll notice at the very bottom of my passage guide, I've taken several of those sections and I've actually collapsed them. At the end of each one of these rows, there's a small little arrow on the left. All that you need to do is click that arrow to, uh, to expand and to collapse each section. If you feel like your passage guide is very slow opening, all you need to do is right click on one of these rows and say collapse all. And next time when you close your passage guide, it will save that setting 
And when you run a passage search from the home page, it will open up the passage guide without expanding each of these sections and it will open up much faster. You can simply you can simply click on them and expand them as you need them as you're studying through the passage. So this gives you a quick overview of what the passage guide is and all the sections that are in it. Now let me give you a quick uh, sort of preview of why this is so important. Under guides, not only do we have all these guides, but down on the bottom left we also have something that says make a new guide template. In other words, once you learn what all these guides do and you learn what all these different sections are, you can then create your own guide that has exactly the sections you want. So for example, in the passage guide, maybe you said, wow, I love that parallel passages section. I love the systematic theology section. I love this one and this one. And I wish I had a guide that just had those three or those four sections. That's what you're gonna learn how to do at the end of this training. Once we know what all we can work with, then we can customize it. So to the right of the passage guide, we have another guide opened up for us, and this is called your exegetical guide. Your exegetical guide is a more language detailed study focused guide. So the very first section is the textual variance section. If you are a language student and you spend a lot of time dealing with textual criticism, this very first section is going to give you everything you need to research that, including your apparatuses, all the additions that you can compare of your Greek and your Hebrew text, ancient versions, whether that be Aramaic or Latin or uh, or whatever, um, those will all be listed here if you have them in your library. And then the last section of the textual variant section will be online manuscripts where you can actually go view images of the oldest manuscripts that we have, that the world has, uh, of the text that you're studying. Lagos will also go through for your exegetical guide and search all your Greek or Hebrew grammars and find any discussions of your text in those grammars. I like this section because I like to look at it as almost a different type of commentary. This commentary is not discussing the meaning of my passage, but it is talking about very unique details of the grammar in the original languages, and that might get, give me some really powerful insight into the meaning of the text. Grammatical Constructions looks through your passage and finds important uh, grammatical phenomena so that you can actually do some great searches. So for example, we have an articular infinitive in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. If you wanted to find every articular infinitive, all you'd have to do is simply click search and it will run a search and find every one for you. You'll find other things in here like the Granville Sharp rule. You'll find weak verbs in the Old Testament and so on. So this is a very powerful section that helps you launch into some, some pretty amazing searches. Visualiza visualizations are gonna be your visual diagrams of the text that you can use to um, observe details in the syntax and the grammar. So I'll just give you one quick example uh, just for visual purposes. I'll go ahead and open this in a floating window. So this would give you an example of a clausal diagram or in this case a syntax graph. This is the Cascadia syntax graphs of the New Testament. And you can see how all the syntax has actually been graphed out and diagrammed for you so that you can interact with it and, and make observations on that level. Once again, we have interactives listed, and then we have the heart of the exegetical guide, which is the word-by-word -word section. This section actually goes through each verse, puts the Greek, ne Greek or the Hebrew next to the English, and you can interact with this and say, I'm going to click on the word past. It'll take you down to a section where that word is discussed. We can see the manuscript, or in other words, the, the original word in the form. So for example, here's the parsing. We have our verb, aorist, active, indicative, third person, plural. That is this word right here. And then below that, we have what we call the lemma. The lemma will always have the circle next to it, the little word graph. And the lemma is what you use to do your word studies. This is what you look up in the dictionary. The outcome. We also have pronunciations. For the, the Greek, if you have version 7, we've added the Hebrew pronunci pronunciations also, and you have access to all of your original language lexicons also right here in your exegetical guide so that you can very quickly and easily uh, jump into your word studies. Now this information is a, is a great way to connect us over to our information box in the top right hand corner. The information box allows us to find a lot of this information simply by hovering or clicking on a word in our text. In this case, you'll notice that as I move my text 
or, or my cursor over the text, notice that nothing's happening to my information box. That's because I've changed the setting from hover to click. So in the information box, there is a panel menu. You can have this set to update, in other words, to change its information, either when you hover over a word or when you click on a word. I like mine set to click because when it's set to hover, it's constantly changing on me and usually changing when I don't want it to. And so click gives me more control. So now I simply come over and I am going to click on the word unaware in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice that my information box immediately fills up with information on the definition of that word. The second section is the translation section, which gives me a comparison of how different versions of the Bible have translated that word. So here we can see the ESV, New American, New King James, and New Revised say unaware. King James says that you should be ignorant. NIV, like some English, also say ignorant. New Living says to forget about, and so on. So it's very interesting. We actually see some, some, some difference here between how English versions have, have chosen to translate this word. The next section is the word information section. So it's very similar to what we see in the exegetical guide, just a little bit uh, a different way to approach it. So very, the very first word that we see, we see what we call the manuscript. So this is the actual uh, inflected or conjugated form of the word, and we see its transliteration. Below that, we see the lemma or the lexical form that we can use to do our word studies, and we see the transliteration, and once again, the pronunciation. I've got information on the root, the parsing, the Strong's numbers, the Laudanida numbers, and also what we call the sense, so the general gloss, what the word means here. Okay, now this brings us to our next guide. We saw it earlier when I was showing you layouts, but from here, if you wanted to do an in-depth word study on this particular word, agnoeo. agnoeo, how would you do that? Well, it's as simple as clicking on the lemma in your information box. Watch what happens. Over on the left-hand side, Lagos is opening up a Bible word study guide for us. Now, I'm going to go ahead and open this in a floating window just to make it easier to see. The very first section of your Bible word study guide gives you all of your lexicons. Okay, up in the upper right-hand corner, you can see a frequency chart. So this word is used 22 times in the New Testament, and I can move my cursor down the chart and actually see the books uh, where it shows up. And we can see Romans seems to be uh, the book that it's used most frequently in. At the bottom of this list, many people don't realize that there's actually morphology charts here. So if you're a language student and you're interested in looking at uh, the different ways this word uh, is used and the different forms, you can simply open up the morphology chart and take a look. The second section of the Bible Word Study Guide is the translation section, um, which is normally what we think of when we think of a word study because I'm wanting to see what are all the different ways that my Bible has translated that Greek word? So we can see that. And I can also see all the places where this word is used in the New Testament. All I did was click on the word, and I can scroll down and see that the ESV translated this word ignorant five times, and here's all the places where it did that. It translated unaware four times, and here's all the passages where it's done that. So if I want to simply view a portion of this, all I have to do is click a portion of the graph, and I can just observe those passages where the ESV translated as recognized or not recognized. Next, we have the Septuagint translation section, which helps me dig into the background usage of the word. In this particular case, are there places where it's been used in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint? This is a powerful section because we can actually see the background usage of a word and how it was used in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint. Now, there are many more sections to the Bible Word Study Guide that we will get into in a more advanced training, but please take some time to walk through those and familiarize yourself with all, what all they can do and how they can help you. Now, we're going to look back at our guide section real quick. Notice we've covered the passage guide, the exegetical guide, the Bible Word Study Guide. All of these, once again, we got incredible amounts of information simply by typing in our passage and clicking Go or clicking on the lemma. Last, we have the Sermon Starter Guide and the Topic Guide. These are very fast, very quick guides to show you. So I'm gonna go ahead and close everything in my workspace, and I'm gonna go back to the home page.
Now this time, I want us to type in a topic into our Go box. 1 Corinthians 10 was all about how Israel failed under temptation. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 is saying, do not follow their example. Please know that God is not going to give you more than you can handle as you're dealing with temptation. And so we shouldn't follow that example and disobey him and walk in unbelief the way they did. So let's say we were wondering, what does the rest of the Bible teach us on this topic of temptation? We're going to simply type that word in. Logos is going to ask us, hey, are you looking for a specific passage on temptation, the temptation of Jesus, or just the general topic of temptation? So you could click on the top one, or in this case, I'm just going to click the word go. Now, when we click go, you'll notice that Logos creates a completely different workspace for us. So our layout is totally different now. We have our topic guide on the left. We have our sermon starter guide over on the left. We have our Bible in the top right, and then we have all of our resources, our books, down in the bottom right. So let's walk through these two guides uh, very quickly. As far as the, the topic guide goes, the most important section for you to, um, to note is the first one on topic. What this does is it gives you access to all of the articles on temptation that you'll find in your reference works. So in your Bible dictionaries, Bible encyclopedias that give you a nice bird's eye view, an overview of the topic of temptation in the Bible, this will give you that information and quick access to it. The Sermon Starter Guide is amazing. Please, even if you're not a pastor, you need to note how powerful this section is and the value that it brings to you, even if you're not preparing a sermon. First, please note that the Sermon Starter Guide is going to give you key passages. So key passages that talk about temptation and pericopes where you can find stories and larger sections of scripture that expound on that topic. Next, you've got a sermon section. Uh, if you have any sermon collections like Tim Keller or Charles Spurgeon or whoever, John Piper, they'll show up here if they have any sermons on that topic. Preaching resources. If you have preaching resources like Bible illustrations and stories, if you have sermon outlines, things like that, this is the section where those will show up. And the last section that I want to point out to you is called thematic outlines. This is usually everyone's favorite section because it's extremely helpful. It basically creates uh, subtopics related to that broad topic of temptation, and it will create an outline study on that subtopic. For example, where else do we find Satan as the tempter <clears throat> or acting as a tempter in Scripture? We could simply click, and we've got an entire study on that topic already uh, spelled out and outlined for us. Another example, resisting temptation. What does the Bible say on resisting temptation? Well, we have an outline study already created for us. And the value of this is that realistically, there are going to be times where we find ourselves in a situation where we need content very quickly, and we don't have time to do an exhaustive, detailed study and put it together. Maybe someone that we're discipling calls us up and says, I'm really struggling. Can you meet with me this afternoon? And you're thinking, yes, but I've got nothing to bring. Well, we simply go to our sermon starter guide, open up our resisting temptation outline, and I'm going to come over here where it says copy and simply click. And what Logos will do is it will take that study. It will drop it right into a Word document for me so that all I have to do is email this, print it out, take my computer, whatever. We can open up the Word together and walk through a really powerful study. So that's the topic guide, the sermon starter guide. You'll also know that, note that a Bible Word study guide has been opened for you. This is, is nice because it also will connect you with articles um, that maybe you haven't seen before on this broader topic that didn't show up in the topic guide. So even though it's doing an English word study, you may find some really helpful articles in the Bible word study guide also. So in conclusion, the guides are your best friend, especially when you're first learning how to use the software, because simply by typing in any passage or any topic right here into the go box, Simply click and go, Logos will tap into these guides and get you just about any kind of information you could possibly want. Now, some of you may be saying, that is absolutely incredible, but what if I don't need all that information and I only need certain parts of that information, depending upon my study? Maybe I'm doing a study uh, in a church history class on a passage. How can I just get the ancient literature section or the cultural concepts section or something like that? Well, that's where knowing how to make your own guide template comes in. 
So let's go ahead and let's wrap up our time together and let's create our own guide template that is customized to our own specific study. I'm going to go ahead and click on the bottom left where it says make a new guide template. You'll notice when you click a panel is opened up, your guide template editor. First thing that you want to do is give your guide a title. For this one, I'm going to call mine sermon prep. So I'm creating a sermon prep guide. So in other words, when I sit down to prepare my sermon, I want all the content that is going to be most helpful for me in studying out the passage and putting the sermon together. So just to give you an example, over on the left-hand side, you're going to have all the sections that we saw in our guides, our passage guide, exegetical guide, our sermon, our sermon starter guide, and our topic guide. I can These are alphabetical order. So I simply move down through here and pick, for example, commentaries. Maybe I would also like, I like that new figurative language section. And I'm also going to add systematic theologies, thematic outlines, and the word by word section. The word by word section is one of my favorites. So you can actually take these and organize them. So if you have one that you want to be in a different place, simply drag them to where you want them. Notice that, at least with the commentaries in the word-by-word -word section, there's some ways you can customize it. So instead of 10 commentaries, I'm going to say I want um, 5 commentaries listed. And then down in the word-by-word -word section, I actually want it to give me information on every word in my passage, not just uh, words with a certain frequency. So now I have created my sermon prep guide. There's nothing else that I need to do other than close it. So I close it, I go back up to my guides, and you'll notice that I have actually two sermon prep guides because uh, I've created more than one for training purposes, but we'll use the one here at the bottom. I'm simply going to click on sermon prep. It's going to open up my guide. All I have to do now is type in the passage I'm studying. We'll use Genesis 1, 1, hit enter. Notice what we've got. I've got five commentaries listed. I've got my thematic outlines listed here. So I've got a nice outline study on God the Creator and where else I find information on that in Scripture. There's no figure of language specifically in this passage, at least not tagged in the software. We have my systematic theology section, and we also have the word-by-word -word section. So all I need to do is add my Bible right alongside, and as I'm studying through the text, I've got all the original language information that I need to be able to dig into de the details of each word in my passage. So, once again, Lagos software is incredibly powerful. It's designed for you to customize it, but as you're learning how to use it, you can tap into incredible information by simply using the search bar on the top and letting those guides pull out all the information in the library for you. Also, please take note that as you're studying and you're getting all your information together, you don't want to lose that and have to, have to open it all back up. So make sure you go over to layouts and you save your layout so that you can get back to it anytime you need to. So I hope this gives you a great starting point for launching into your study with Lagos Bible software. Please keep in mind that we have more trainings to come, but this is a great place to get started. Hopefully you feel comfortable navigating the software. Please share this with others if you think that it could help them. Thank you so much for your time.